Okay, Kathy. Hey, Patrick. Welcome. How are you? I'm awesome. How about you? I'm so good. I'm you know uh, New York is a little wild. We are epicenter of everything. I'm in my home 23 hours a day and leave to go on walks. Uh, that's basically it. So yeah. I have a lot of food. Um, this is one of the moments where I have a lot of sympathy for people that have children. I don't have kids. So it's just, it's wildly quiet. Like I live in a busy neighborhood in New York and come nine o'clock, everything's closed. No bars, no restaurants. Normally you'd hear music, you know, horns honking, mm -hmm. sirens, uh, people yelling, whatever, and nothing. It's just, it's none of that. like living in the woods. That's what it looks like on the news. When I see the news and they show Broadway with zero people walking around, or maybe the random person like you going out for an exercise walk. Uh, but yeah, the, the news portrays New York City as a ghost town right now. Yeah. What's Fort happening? Worth, Dallas and Fort Worth uh, have gone shelter into place mm -hmm. two different, at two different dates, and, which is interesting. But we've only been shelter in place for about a week. So it's still very active, not like New York. Um, what, are you, what are you and your husband doing to stay sane? Well, he goes to work every day because Lockheed, he works for Lockheed Martin okay. and he is um, required to still go in mm -hmm. to do his work. And, but to stay sane, I've got a puzzle out on the dining room table. I've got a craft project in another area. I've got a book out. Um, going on long walks with my dog, longer mm. walks than normal, um, just to kind of get out and about. And as a high extrovert, oh my gosh, this is very difficult to do. Oh, I, I I've also you, noticed that, what now? Oh, I think you and I are both extroverted. <laughs> it's hitting. This is so hard. <laughs> um, it's so hard for extroverts, right? And so, um, you know, as, as uh, we were talking earlier, I have done more virtual happy hours in the past two weeks than is reasonable. And um, we're doing one this weekend with some friends from college that mm. are um, all international all over the world. And so we are literally setting the time. It's the tradition from an organization I was involved with in, at North Dakota State called Blue Key. And we used to go out afterwards um, for happy hour. We called that brown key. And if the brown key turned into black key, sometimes that happened when we stayed out a little too late. Um, but we're going to have a, a blue key, brown key phone call this weekend. And I'm really looking forward to seeing some friends I haven't seen in years. Like, I don't know why we weren't doing this hmm. before. Yeah. Why does it take a shelter in place mandate for us to become creative in how we reach out to our friends and family members that we haven't seen? That's so fun. I love that. Uh, this, this past week, I actually created uh, Zoom trivia for a bunch of friends. And we had maybe eight or 10 people join. And I came up with a list of questions, including a picture round when I shared my screen. And it was great. Um, okay, that sounds fun. Really fun. Um, I realized that the questions I made were too hard because nobody was, nobody was scoring more than five points around. So if we do it again, I will, I will dumb it down a little bit, but um, it was great. And That's awesome. That's great. The picture round was um, showing people the symbols that are on your clothes around how to wash them, <laughs> right? And, and basically people have to guess, what does this mean? It means permanent right. pass, it means whatever. In the, because in New York, most of us use laundromats or even wash and fold. And so we have this whole group, of, you know, whole group of millennials that is now trying to figure out how to wash their own clothing for, in a uh, bathtub for the first time. So that um, that is, that's pretty funny. Do you have a washing machine in your in your apartment? Oh no, I have a bathtub and I have some laundry detergent, and uh, I, I'm not out of clean clothes yet. But at some point, that might be what we get to. Wow. Well, so, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're being creative in how you take care of your clothing. <laughs> I mean, it's so interesting. You know, I'm sure that we talked to a lot of people and. And obviously some of them are feeling anxious and it's so strange to feel anxious about your own health and your family's health, but also things like, like, how am I going to cut my own hair? Right. If, if this lasts for two months. Um, and so there's just a lot to think about. And I recommend you don't. Thank you. I, I did get a, I did get a short haircut right before all this happened, knowing that if we were shelter in place, like I'm not very good with scissors, especially right. my own head. So we'll see. I had one of those in the eighth grade moments where I thought I would cut my bangs. I'll never touch my bangs again. And, this, and I realized this morning, my bangs are way too long right now. I'm like having to like, you know, have a part in the middle. Yeah. So I'm thinking about checking out Madison Reed hair color if I uh, can't get to my colorist in the next few. <laughs> you look great. Uh, once I cut my brother's hair uh, after convincing him it would be a great idea. And he, he doesn't let me live it down because it, it was not a good idea. 
Uh, well, let's let's talk about plan giving. So you are one of the smartest minds in plan giving. You're sweet. Uh, you're Thank you are working with a lot of organizations in Texas, outside of Texas. I know you were up in in Washington State recently. Um, so, what are you seeing? How are people reacting? Um, what's happening on the ground? So where, where we are in Fort Worth, Dallas, it is not, it hasn't hit here as much as it has in some of the other regions. Mm -hmm. It had already hit in the Washington state area the last time I was there, which was about two and a half weeks ago. And I was reminiscing last night with my husband saying, you know, when I flew there and, and flew through SeaTac and then flew on to Bellingham, literally when I got there, folks were asking me, well, what did you see at SeaTac? What, were people wearing masks more than usual? Because SeaTac is an airport that you will often find people wearing the masks just for general travel purposes. And um, I would say it wasn't a huge increase in face masks uh, at SeaTac, but there were, there were more. And what I'd never seen before were face masks being worn um, on the flight to Bellingham. Mm. So th there were four people wearing them on the flight to Bellingham. So I w met with a lot of physicians while I was there and even the physicians were still very, um, things are normal. Uh, we didn't hug, we did the elbow bump. But um, so that was unusual because I'm a hugger. And um, so it was, that got me very adapted to the, we'll start doing the fist, bu the fist bump and elbow bumps. But coming home is when we really started seeing it here. So I think that the West Coast in particular, and then now the East Coast have had a lot more experience with where we are in this new normal. In talking with my clients on what does this look like for us and what our passion is, what we do for our careers, what we do for our communities, um, we have just been talking about the ways they can still stay in front of their folks mm -hmm. in very creative ways. The importance is um, making sure that you are empathetic and still in a, a, a cultivation stewardship mode, but utilizing empathy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we need to be out and about, you know, raising funds for major gift projects and capital campaigns and things like that. But uh, the other types of, of stewardship that you would normally do is what is essential at this point in time. So I think that it is important for us to, as you have said in your webinars, be human, mm -hmm. share what's going on in, in your world. Um, and if you are having a crisis, maybe you are an organization that is literally feet on the ground in a crisis, then Maybe you can make an appeal for an emergency fund, things like that. But as far as fundraising, active fundraising goes, I, I say put it on the back burner, do your donor, donor stewardship, and um, communicate with them about how you're responding. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me to see how some organizations are so quick to lay folks off. Mm. Um, we're seeing a lot of that right now in our community. And um, I think that that could be for some organizations the best decision and then for others i think it could be very short-sighted and it could it ultimately come back and unhaunt them a little bit if the pandemic isn't as long tenured as it could be mm -hmm. in some of the some of the estimations yeah. how about you what are you seeing i mean we're seeing a lot of the same things i i one quick point on the layoffs before we get off topic there I think people don't realize how much you can repurpose existing staff. So let's say you're a museum and the museum curator is not doing much or the receptionist isn't doing much because the museum's closed. That's totally understandable. Those people can do stewardship calls and maybe they're not calling the top, top donors. Your gift officers are still handing those relationships. Yep. Anyone that's giving you $250, $300, um, call those people. And then you can ask them if, if they wanna have a follow-up conversation about ways to help and you can bring in a gift officer at that moment. So these right. people don't have to be highly skilled gift officers overnight, but they can be humans having conversations. And that museum curator is an interesting person. And, and they, they're going through their own stuff. They can share some of that. So um, we're seeing that. I mean, I think, go ahead. I think that's awesome. I think that's really good. You know, I've always said that everyone in a nonprofit organization is a fundraiser. Everyone. everyone. So whether you're the security guard that, that monitors the parking lots and makes sure that cars and vehicles are safe, or you're the chief development officer, everyone in, or, in an organization is a fundraiser. 
and has an impact on what the donor's perception is and what the client's perception is, the person who benefits from the mission, mm -hmm. um, what their perception is of that organization. So I love the idea of repurposing people. And I've seen that in some of the healthcare organizations that I've worked in. And, you know, of course, I came from a healthcare, healthcare background too. I worked, you know, 12 years in, in different health systems. And we would, during different pigs, you know, the swine flu epidemic and N1H1 and all of those, we would repurpose people. You know, I wasn't turned into a clinical person overnight, but we would help with um, some of the intake or helping patients find where they need to go. Um, but I love the idea of repurposing. And I think it's somewhat short-sighted on some organizations to this quickly into it, make decisions regarding some of the staffing. I agree. I mean, we, we put things like phone scripts together so that even if you're not highly trained, you can follow some of that. And, um, you know, most people are good at human connection, right? They're calling their mom, they're calling their aunt, they're calling their sister, their nephew, whatever. And they don't need to be even asking for money yet. They can do that. And then I think the big avenue there is that some people are really ready to help and some people are not. And so right. how do you figure out um, permission-based marketing so that, or permission-based conversations. So you have a stewardship conversation and say, hey, look, the museum's on hard times. Um, would you like to have a conversation about how you can help? And maybe they say, no, I can't do that right now. And you say, great, well, look, we've been thinking about you and that's fine. But if they say, yes, let's get a major gift officer on the phone. Um, one of the things that we've seen in psychology is that you know, disasters and other big moments scramble things. And so people that have never been big benefactors, they can step up. Some benefactors are gonna to have to step back because they're worried about something in particular, but people hold this anxiousness and this interest for impact simultaneously, and that's okay. Well, and have you, have you been following the, and I'm sure you have because of your business, um, the interest on even just the online searches for estate plans and wills. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's quadrupled, if not higher than that, uh, the interest for individuals to take care of their planning. So while, to, to the point you just made, while they may not be in a position to help you right now, mm -hmm. they still may be in a position to help you in a deferred manner. Right. And they still may, they may look to you as an organization that is really taking care of um, a lot of the community needs right now in this emergent time, or it may even just be the museum who's not necessarily a first responder to the pandemic. Um, but if they have developed that type of relationship with you, that they do want to elevate you to the status of a family member, a deferred gift is the perfect thing to talk about if it evolves into that type of conversation. And normally we know whether the person is receptive to that type of conversation right now. People are really worried about several things. They're worried about their health. They're worried about their family's health. They are worried about their, the, their coworkers. They're worried about whether or not they're gonna have a job. They're worried about the health of their retirement plan. We've seen a crazy last week or so um, in the market. And so my retirement plan has seen a, a, a nice little slide down and then huge back up and then slide down. So we've got to just um, monitor the health of that individual emotionally and what is their connection to you right now and where are their distractions mm -hmm. if they're still worried about themselves their family th they're not going to necessarily want to talk about making donations at this time um, but but i still think that it's it's important for us to stay in touch with people because as you said some will right so one thing that we've seen is i was looking at the data this morning so compared to last march this March is going to be something like three and a half to four times the number of bequests on free will compared to a year ago. So it's not cyclical. It's not that March is magically planned giving time. It's that people right now are really focused on this. And, but given that people are so focused on this mentally, but also charities are a little bit concerned about broaching the topic, how would you suggest people go about doing that? First and foremost, you need to stay in touch with them. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the, I want, I want to talk to you about how you can benefit us, but just stay in touch with them. So do something like what we're doing. Have video calls with some of your donors that you're the closest to. Send them handwritten notes. I'm in the process of sending a whole bunch of notes to people um, in Washington State, and I'm including tea bags. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm including sweet dreams and cozy chamomile because I figure they're their anxiety is probably more heightened and they could use that calming 
Um, you know, but it's a nice touch. It's just mm. that human touch. Um, I was visiting with a former colleague this past week and they were in the process of planning a board meeting mm -hmm. and they were talking to local restaurants to see if they could have a meal delivered to that board member mm -hmm. before the online, the video, the video board meeting so that they would have that sense of normalcy of still having a board meeting over lunch. And so that's what they're in the process of doing. We could totally, um, you know, send some things to our donors right now outside of even handwritten notes. Mm -hmm. If you are the type of organization that is local, not necessarily national, um, or doesn't have a huge region, and you, you probably know where some of your closest donors live, some of your best volunteers live, you could totally drop by just a little bouquet of flowers or mm -hmm. um, some kind of little... Um, item that you picked up at the grocery store, obviously we want to present everything in a safe manner so that people are not afraid to pick it up and take it into their home. But at the same time, um, you can uh, make that touch without being there. I, even if it's just a phone call. Mm -hmm. We've been seeing on the news the creative ways that grandchildren are seeing their grandparents and great grandparents that are um, isolated in assisted living facilities or maybe mm -hmm. in the hospital where they talk to each other through windows. Well, we're talking to each other through a window right now and right. we could do the same thing at, a, at someone's doorstep. So I, I encourage that. Hmm. I love the idea you had around sending tea and relaxation tea and just saying, we know this is stressful times, we're thinking about you. Those tea bags must cost 20 cents a piece plus a stamp plus a letter. I mean, it's basically you know, just the time that you're taking and it's so thoughtful and I can imagine getting that and being so touched. I found a really neat uh, proverb that I'm writing on the inside too, so they don't think I just randomly chose tea. Mm -hmm. um, but it says, tea is drunk to forget the din of the world mm. and the noise of the world. Mm. It's, it's drunk in that moment. That's and great. if you look up tea, there's lots of different really um, philosophical approaches to drinking tea, drinking it in solitude, drinking it. So it's, I think it's kind of a dual, a dual purpose. Um, but sweet dreams and, and cozy chamomile, to me, just uh, represented what I'm hoping people are able to feel and not the anxiety that some of us have, even from moment to moment. My emotions, I watch the news and I get sad for you. I get sad mm -hmm. for your friends and colleagues. And I worry about all my friends that live in New York. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's nothing that I can do about that. So. It's, I mean, it's, it's real. I, I used to sleep. Yeah eight hours every night and now I routinely clock six and a half or seven. I just wake up and my mind is racing and feel anxious. Yeah. So, um, one thing we're seeing is, uh, you know, obviously, right, there's sort of the immediate thing of what do we do right now for nonprofit organizations and fundraisers. But one thing we're trying to help people understand is that, that at least for 2020, this is going to be the new normal. Like we may go back to work, public transit may pick up a little bit, but it's unlikely that we're gonna have large gatherings of older donors, right? It's just not gonna be responsible until there's a widespread vaccine. And so we're looking, you know, at least through the summer, maybe even into the fall, where you know, it's not that we're not doing anything, we're not under, you know, may not be under lock and key here, but we're not gonna have 90 person galas or 500 person galas where, where people who are 70 and 80 are, are strolling in and, and talking. Right. So um, we're doing a webinar on Tuesday that is helping people move to plan B and saying, you know, wait and see is not really an option. What are your suggestions in terms of people now mapping out the rest of 2020? Because they've worked so hard on really thoughtful plans that are now getting scrapped. So what would you say to folks who are back to the drawing board in terms of how to hit their, their plan giving goals or their major giving goals in 2020? I think we need to be very creative in how we're approaching it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was recently talking with an individual who had uh, planned on a, a large walk run, like a 10K thing or a 5K. I don't, know, I don't know what it was, but it was a walk run. And they had printed all these t-shirts up and we were talking about it. And I'm like, well, I know that you relied on a lot of money around that event and that activity, but could you not still reach out to those individuals that would have registered or had been registered um, and talk with them honestly about the situation and explain to them, okay, we're not able to have this event but we would still love to send you the t-shirt if you're interested in making a mm -hmm. gift. And you know, there's ways it could, it could almost become a, you know, I was talking with somebody else yesterday. It could become a commemorative shirt. Mm -hmm. 
and it could be something that is rallied around. So that non-event event that we've heard about, um, people exploring the ideas of doing more and more over the last few years, I think could really become a, a true thing. And like you said, even if things return to normal, I still think, and, and we never hear of coronavirus again, if we never hear that again, I'm gonna be more acutely aware of how I react during flu season. Mm -hmm. What are my actions during a flu season even? And, and the flu kills many people every year. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're right. I think we've permanently, um, we have become, um, what, 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 there's a famous, uh, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the, the world became non-innocent or whatever, <laughs> whatever the phrase was, we became, you know, what, what? I don't know, but I, but I know. But yeah, I mean, Camelot was broken and we all lost our innocence. Mm -hmm. I think that this event has kind of brought us that same loss of innocence again, where we are going to be even more heightened about it. So with regards to activities, I would literally reach out. If you had a big gala, um, reach out to those donors that would have purchased a table and ask them to reach out to the people they would have invited to that table and talk with them about the importance of that need because your mission is still important, it's still critical. And, and see if they're in a role to be able to be your you know, street on the feet, mouths on the phone, to raise some of those funds that will, um, that will be in lieu of what that event would have garnered. I think that that's gonna be vital. I think we're gonna become very creative, like you ever see really large, huge groups of donors brought together again, particularly mm -hmm. um, the older the older generation, and um, I, but I still think there's ways to you know to speak the, the mission, talk about the, the importance of the mission, and talk about how their gift impacts that mission. And as you and I both know, events, galas, walk runs, uh, whatever it might be, fashion shows they all cost a lot of money wow. to raise every single dollar that comes in the door, which always, which goes back to something that you and I are both passionate about, which is the ROI mm -hmm. of legacy gifts. Right. And so I think that if we can become better at articulating what a dollar's impact is on the organization without an event ticket attached to it, mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll probably end up raising more money. You know, this will end. Right. We will go back to some sense of normalcy, Mm -hmm. And the markets, even if it continues to go down or go back up and go back down, we're going to see that throughout the rest of our lives many times over. Right. And um, I think that the, the ways we can become better at articulating our missions and expressing our gratitude for their support of the mission, the ROI will start to, to prove that those events and galas and whatever's are not necessarily needed. Yeah, Kathy, I, I think you make an incredible point here, which is there's a mindset shift, which is are we seeing this as a crisis or an opportunity? And certainly it's a crisis from a health standpoint, and I don't want to undermine that at all. But from a nonprofit fundraising standpoint, expectations have shifted so dramatically that now if you're the dean of a school or you're the executive director, you can have a video call and that's expected and you can have a half hour video call and you can do four or five of those in a day instead of going out and visiting, right? And you're saving money on travel you're saving time, and suddenly you can actually up your productivity to an enormous degree. And right. instead of a gala, galas take so much time. I mean, I'm sure you, you do this. Sometimes we'll talk to nonprofits and they'll say, look, this is really exciting. We'd love to work with Free Will, but can you call us after April when our gala season is? And setting aside the actual cost of the gala, the whole organization focus on it for months is just an enormous opportunity cost and real-time cost and salary. And so now people, we can turn people into you know, virtual galas that might take a tenth of the time and a hundredth of the money. Um, such a big opportunity for people that are, that are optimists and ambitious and creative. Many people don't think about the staff time that it takes, the, the cost of a staff. Mm -hmm. So they don't even incorporate, when they're reporting to their boards, they're not even incorporating the cost of the staff that could have been doing other activities. A friend of mine wrote a blog this week that it may get published in the next week or so, and I'll share I'll share it with you when I when I when it does. Um, but it was about a gala dress. So mm -hmm. so she bought a, a dress to go to an event, and the event's been canceled, and now she's got the dress. And what is she going to do with this dress? Not only would she have dressed up, jeweled up, makeuped up, haired up, she would have you know she would have spent money getting all ready for this. She would have 
spent money the night there too. I mean, mm -hmm. so you, you, there's, there is so much opportunity. So she is right. She wrote this blog that talks about now that I can't go to this gala, what can I do that will still benefit the organization the same way I would have had I, so do I put my dress on eBay or do I just give, send them an outright gift of what I would have spent to get ready and go? Mm -hmm. Or do I donate the dress to another organization that could use it maybe for a prom or something in the future? And I think that there's a, I mean, think about what that dress now symbolizes with regards to the dollars that could go to an organization. Mm -hmm. So I think that we do need to become a little bit more creative. I won't say that I'm a hundred percent anti-event, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not on the top of my list. If I'm an organization, an, an organizational leader, I don't want my whole revenue coming in from different events because as this is showing, we can see the impact of events being canceled on organizations. Mm -hmm. um, blizzards happen, hurricanes happen, uh, lots of different things happen and events get canceled and then folks have to scramble to make up the revenue that mm -hmm. that would have had. And I think we're gonna see that happening all over the country. Um, so it's a good opportunity to think outside the box. It's a huge moment. And it's also the case that coming back to that earlier conversation, the security guard, the museum curator, the receptionist, they can have those conversations. You can call through an entire attendee gala list, gala mm -hmm. attendee list, in not that long, in two days, right? If everyone's, mm -hmm. if everyone's on board and, and think about all the time that would have gone in, right? The, yeah. all the, the time, all the curating staff and um, pretty remarkable. Um, cool, well, we should wrap up soon. Um, what, any, any big final words to the planned giving community and the major giving community? My, my biggest point goes back to stay in front of your folks. Just mm -hmm. be human, stay in front of them, call them, write them, drop something off if you can. Um, that you making that effort is going to be remembered in the mm -hmm. long run. If a nonprofit has, had called me this week just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you, that, that impact is long lasting beyond just the sheltering in place that we're doing mm -hmm. right now. And I think that we have a lot more free time on our hands right now. And some people are learning and doing Rosetta Stone and watching movies and TV. And, but we could also continue our work, mm -hmm. touching, uh, making touch points, moves management type points with our donors, telling them how much you appreciate them, how much you love them. And, um, and if the conversation comes up and you're able to continue to talk with them about support now or support in the future, um, I think it's important that you have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've seen this. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, you're feeling anxious, I'm feeling anxious. Most of our team is feeling anxious. But actually when we can then put ourselves to work and go help the nonprofits we work with and when those nonprofits are going to help their donors, when their donors are helping them, this collectivism actually just feels like it's rolling off our shoulders. And suddenly I feel a lot better and happier. Exactly, exactly. It helps your own health. The outlook, the positive outlook, and those conversations that are going to be happy on both ends help your health. Your health will be improved. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's wrap up there. It was so great yeah. to see you. And uh, Kathy, what is the website for people to learn more about Think Giving? www.thinkgiving.com. Easy. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And thank nice. you, Patrick. Stay healthy. Thanks.